very happy, very honored to be here speaking with you today. I understand that we have a lot of people here with us that are in the world of education and psychology. So welcome to all of you. Um, let me start by saying that we're going to spend a little time together right now on how to better cope with what is going on in the world and hopefully give you some insights and some really great concrete tools that you can use at any moment and you can share with other people. The reality is right now is that even though we are very, very many individual differences among us and what our experience has been with this pandemic, there is a great deal of universal happening for us in the human race. And this pandemic has really ungrounded us in all kinds of ways. Uh, people say it has shaken them to the core. Our vulnerabilities that we each have are sort of heightened, right? And so we really must access our strengths and find some resources and tools to help us navigate this. COVID-19 has required people, each of us actually, to tolerate a high level of uncertainty. I don't know about you, but most of us aren't big fans of uncertainty. And we, we like to have some predictability, some familiarity. We like to be able to plan. And it's been very difficult that we've been stuck for some time in, are we safe? Are we not safe? What decisions is it okay to make? Struggling to find balance in our new lives, struggling to feel productive, uh, feeling way more exhausted. These are all the things that my clients that I see every week are sharing. Many people be, being very devastated financially and having a very difficult time f even finding the basic goods that we need to be sheltering in place. So many people are also experiencing feeling not only more stress, but finding themselves being more reactive and more irritable with their loved ones and feeling like they have a very hard time getting things done, feeling very unproductive. So these are some things that we're going to address. If any of these things are resonating for you, then you've come to the right place today. So I'm actually going to start in a, in a very unpopular way here. And I'm going to ask you to think of something that is a moderate stressor in your life currently. Think of something that a relationship, a task, something that you have to do rather regularly that is causing you some stress, whether it's in your home or in your job. So once you brought this up into your mind, I want you to just connect to it for a moment and we're all gonna have this shared experience of just noticing what starts to happen in our body and in our mind when we go into a little bit more of a stress response. So if you can let yourself start to experience it, then you can see it, hear it, notice what you're feeling. Notice where in your body the stress starts to manifest. Is it in your jaw, your neck? your digestive system, your back. Notice where you start to feel the stress. See if you can stay with it just a moment longer. And now notice if you're thinking about this stressful moment, where is your tongue? It's a very strange question. Is your tongue sticking up into the roof of your mouth or pushing into the back of your teeth? If you can notice that your tongue is sort of tight as you're connecting to this stressful thing, what I want to invite you to do now is notice what happens if you just drop your tongue and relax it completely and allow your jaw to relax. And you may even want to assist your jaw by following it down. So when we relax our tongue, this is a fascinating thing that our tongue is very much 
a signal about our stress level because our tongue has nine cranial nerves running through it and it really connects our brain and our body to multiple systems. So I call it baby drool face because it's like a baby drooling. And when we do that in a moment of stress, it's immediately our blood pressure will lower, our heart rate will slow, our muscles will start to relax and we should start to feel a downshift, a little bit of a slowing down in our brain and our body. So what you can do to make it even more effective is to add a nice, long, slow exhale to your relaxed tongue. Now we're also gonna talk about our main sabotager, the main culprit that keeps us stuck and that is this right here. The thoughts can often really sabotage our tools that we're trying to use to manage our stress. So we will talk about that. Now, hopefully you had a little bit of a sense of that. Let's talk about the signs of stress. I bet we all have them right now. Low energy, irritable, indecisive, changes in your sleeping habits, changes in your eating habits, loss of enjoyment, so doing things that you typically do but not really feeling the pleasure of it. Having somatic complaints, we know absolutely that stress gets stored in our body and we begin to develop stress patterns in how we move through the world. So headaches, muscles hurting, back pain, digestive issues, bloating, nausea, all of these things can be indicators of stress being held in the body, having difficulty concentrating, having difficulty in your communication. These are all indicators of stress. And so people often say, well, we're all under stress. So when and how do we know if that's an issue? It, all of these things in the world of mental health are a matter of degree. So picture a continuum and think of a day that you did pretty well and you weren't very stressed and then a day you are more stressed, and then a day that you really just had difficulty coping. And it was really affecting your life on multiple levels. And mental health diagnoses are generally determined on a continuum where we've sort of said, okay, when you get to this point, when it's affecting you in these ways, now it's more serious. There is no right or wrong. You don't have to wait until it's a severe diagnosis to get help. In fact, in the mental health world, we encourage people to go before we get to that point, before it's a crisis and the marriage is erupting and people are feeling very, very distraught by your not being well. We ask people to come in before that. And I know that different cultures is it can be really overcoming some stigma to, to reach out and do that. But, you know, Project Corona is a great place, a great resource to help you all. Um, so let me give you an, a tip right away to help us all right now. Most all of you out there, I'm going to guess, are spending more time than usual on a screen, on a device. And here in America and around the world, people are saying they're getting headaches, they're having much more pain in their back. It's very difficult to hold good posture on a screen. But really important that we don't always realize is one of the main culprits is our eyes. Our eyes are very, very strained when we are looking at such a narrow spot uh, versus when we're in a room of people and our, our vision is open and, and around the room. So I'm gonna give you two quick tips right here to help you and I wanna encourage you to do them multiple times a day and encourage your loved ones to do the same. Your eyes really need you to support them more right now. So the first thing is every hour, in fact, less time if possible that you could take an eye break would be really helpful. So, what that means is pausing your eyes from the screen and looking around. But what I want to encourage you to do is actually hold your fingers up like this out in front of you, move them all the way out to the side, look straight ahead and wiggle your fingers and practice opening up your peripheral vision. If you can practice that and look out over your screen, look out a window every now and then, look over across the room that you're in 
This is really going to help your brain and your eyes to not get so strained and contracted. Now, the other one I want you to have right here with your eyes and stress is to take your hands like this in a cupped curve. And we're going to place the heel of our hand right here on our cheekbone. And we're going to cup our hands over our eyes. Okay, so like this. And you're just gonna breathe and keep this little dark cave closed. The longer you can stay there, the better, but I really suggest you do it for at least a minute. At least a minute. I'm hearing that some people are having trouble hearing and I just want to stop and check the audio. Is everyone able to hear me? Yes, we're able to hear you. Okay, great. Some people are having some issues. Okay. So yeah, if you, go ahead. You, are you, you have not started your PowerPoint yet, right? You're sharing your no, screen. No, I have not started a PowerPoint yet, no. Okay, perfect. Yes. So if you can do this, you will actually feel some twitching, spasming. The eye muscles will begin to relax and there's like an unraveling that will happen. So I wanna encourage you to use these eye release techniques to help the strain and the stress that we're all under right now. The other thing, practical tip, is to get up and move around. We are hearing a lot of people having more physical issues from all of this sitting without the breaks and the movement. When you're in an office, for example, or you're in a, in a classroom, you get up and you move between and go to someone else's office. And so if you're sitting too long, you're going to have more issues physically. All right, let me give you a few practical tips and then I wanna go into helping you manage your nervous system better and really help you come back to settle. The more we can grow our center right now, the more resilient we will be, the more we will function and live right now from a place of resource. So I wanna give you several more resources to help you and to share with others. The first thing is that people are having a really hard time right now ending their workday um, in a reasonable time. Some people have deadlines and bosses that are really expecting a great deal from them even though they're at home and they're also trying to handle being in the home or maybe they're not at home anymore and that's creating different issues but it's very difficult this this new balance of work versus personal life so i want to encourage you to work with the people you're sharing space with and you live with about how and when you can end your work day and actually book end your work day. And I also wanna encourage you, really important thing that people are not doing well here is scheduling breaks. You must schedule breaks for eating, for a little bit of replenishment, whatever that is that you can do, something that will just give you a mental, emotional break from work. We must schedule these breaks throughout the day. However you need to do that, please do it. Try to be creative and have some fun times, some time of laughter, some time of connecting with people. I know that for many of us, we don't wanna connect on a screen at the end of the day with our loved ones that we can't see, but it is important that we do it some because we really do start to feel very disconnected and isolated. So please consider how you can stay connected to people outside of your home. Um, I have gone with phone calls on some occasions because I just can't handle the screen anymore. The other thing I wanna mention is laughter is one of the most potent antidotes that we can access right now. It relaxes your body. It gives your immune system a boost for up to 45 minutes when we laugh. It releases endorphins, it's, it helps pain, it improves our mood, it protects our heart. It burns calories, it diffuses anger, and conflict and it we know from research it may even prolong your life so whatever it is that makes you laugh bring some laughter into your day that is a really important one for what we're going through right now okay so 
The next thing is that we're having many different experiences, but lots of shared experiences as well right now. There is a universal need for us to visit our settled system and our nervous system. So now I am going to attempt to share my screen to show you a PowerPoint. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to try and see if this works. Hopefully, it is working. And if you are able to tell me, uh, Nidhi, that would be great. If you can see it. Yes. Okay, see. wonderful, wonderful. So I, I'm not going to go into medical things, but I want you to understand on the left side, when you're in the car and you're braking and you're going very slow, that is your parasympathetic nervous system. And when you're on the right side, and many of you probably already know this, I'm just bringing it into our mind right now. Sympathetic nervous system is our system of action, of mobilization. If you are in movement, if you are in fight mode, high anger, high anxiety, high stress response, or you are in flight mode, I want to get the heck out of here, you are in sympathetic. If you are in slow motion, depression, shut down, feeling numb, can't really feel anything, you are in parasympathetic. But there is a very healthy system in parasympathetic as well, which is our low tone dorsal vagal. Low tone dorsal vagal is where we want to spend more time. We want to develop that as a place we visit often throughout the day. When you meditate, you are in low dorsal vagal. When you get your breath and you control your breath in such a way that you feel everything slow down like baby drool face, and you can feel your body, you're in your body, you're alert, you're calm, you're relaxed, you're settled. That is where we want to spend more time. It's really, really good and healthy to move into parasympathetic and even high and even high sympathetic. There's no problem. We have to use the gas and the brake to get anywhere. Um, now, I know in, in some of the big cities in India, you're not hitting the gas much at all. Sorry to hear that. But generally speaking, you can't get there if you only have a brake. And it's not really safe to get there if you only have a gas pedal. So the same is true with our nervous system. We really need the gas and the brake, but you know, a good driver can use them fluidly without making the people in the car car sick. So that's what we want in a healthy nervous system. And so I want to invite you to think about what we're talking about and all the tools we're gonna discuss over the next few minutes relate to this slide here. The red zone is sympathetic and the purple zone is parasympathetic. The green zone is our low dorsal, our settled, calm, alert state. When we come out of meditation and we feel mindfully aware, that's green. Green is go, 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 let's spend some more time there. Because what happens when we're there in our ventral vagal system is that all of our health systems can come online. So we can experience inflammation going down, immune system going up, uh, we can feel better in our brain and our mind. All of the benefits that we know come from things like yoga and Tai Chi and meditation and Qigong, all of these things help us to get to that green zone. So, so that's what I want you to keep in mind. And now I'm going to stop the share and come back here. And Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So you have your gas and your brake. Now let's bring this into the pandemic and what is happening is that many people are either really on the gas pedal going really, really fast in their brain and their body. They are feeling high stress, high anxiety, high irritation, and they really need to throughout the day tap the brake on their nervous system to drop down and settle because they're up in the red zone. So let me tell you for a moment about anxiety. So this is the real fact about what happens in our brain with anxiety. I hope this will be validating to all of us because I can't imagine many people have not had moments of anxiety in the past three months. In sitting here listening to me, your brain is in top down, correct? top down so your frontal lobe and your thinking brain is activated going down towards the brainstem but when you're in fear an eminent perceived threat 
So that is, I see a car coming straight at me and not braking, and there's no way for me to get out of the way. That's fear. That's a threat in this moment. That is the brain going from the bottom up, okay? Bottom up. Now in anxiety, what's actually happening in your brain is this. You are doing both at the same time. Both bottom up and top down are going on simultaneously. I say that because that really, to me, validates the experience of being in anxiety. Um, here's a really important definition of anxiety that has greatly helped me personally and professionally. Anxiety is always that we are thinking about what could happen in the future, or we are thinking what happened in the past is going to happen again, right? So generally I'm looking at, I'm driving and I see a car near me and I play out the scenario that it's gonna cut off my space and it's going to hit me. So I'm imagining this whole scene happening, but in reality it hasn't happened. It hasn't actually happened. So the difference again between feeling anxious and having an, an anxiety disorder is one of degree. And in our diagnostic statistic manual, uh, number five, which is the one we're on now, um, it's really that it's associated with three or more of the following symptoms, right? Restlessness or keyed up on edge, being easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbances. And it has to be going on um, for more days than not for the past six months. So timeline is also key as to when it then becomes generalized anxiety disorder. None of these things should be bad. It is part of the human experience um, that we have things happen in life that are going to create a sense of anxiety. And our spiritual beliefs and our religious beliefs can be very helpful in helping us settle and find faith and find meditation and prayer to help us uh, trust in the next moment. However, we often need tools to also help us. So when we're in high anxiety or irritability, we need some more of the breaking tools. The baby drool and the long, slow exhale is, are both wonderful somatic body-centered tools that quickly and effectively tap the brakes on your body. So the other one that I wanna imagine when I said the breath is I, I want you to imagine a pinwheel or bubbles, you know that we have the little bubbles that we pull out as children sometimes. And, and so it's a soft, long, slow breath. And we wanna to try to bring that exhale from our belly. We want that exhale to be at least six seconds long. And many of us already practice this in breath work and meditation. But notice what happens if you do this breath three times in a row, can you feel the braking system happening? Wonderful. A breath that I have been activating a lot lately that has been very helpful to me. And I happen to have a little image right behind me here. Imagine a place that you really love to sit at. It may be by a body of water. If you enjoy water, certainly imagine yourself here with your feet right here in the sand. And what I want you to picture is as a wave comes up, you're gonna breathe that wave in through your feet all the way up and track the breath going all the way through your body to the top of your head. You're gonna pause and hold that breath for a couple seconds. And then you're gonna exhale, imaging the wave as a waterfall going all the way down and out your feet as you send it out to the ocean. And this breath is really, really elongating, the inhale and the exhale. If you don't prefer water, imagine a different space that you're in that you're breathing that in up to your head and out. So let's just quickly do a couple of these breaths and see and notice what shifts in your body. Ready? Sending it all the way out to the ocean. So I'm hoping that you were able to notice 
a slowing down, again, a break on your system. Very important that we do this throughout the day, not just when we have time for a long meditation. These are tools we need to use throughout the day, resting our eyes, doing our baby drool face, doing our long, slow exhale, and doing what I call ocean breath. These are just a few tools, um, but for the sake of time, I do have to move to the next one, which is when we're heavy on the break and we need to tap the gas a little bit, um, much like how we feel when we're in the city driving and we wish we could get a little momentum going here. So heavy on the break is when we are feeling very low energy, lethargic, depressed perhaps. So what's interesting is the new DSM has finally brought in that depression and grief are really one in the same, just about how long they last. So they've really changed it so that if you have these symptoms, it could actually be grief that is causing your depression. Right now in this pandemic, everyone, we are all feeling levels of grief. Let me just pause and say that again. We are all experiencing some grief and loss. <sighs> many, many losses that might be not as obvious to define. Very strange the things that people are starting to feel that they miss. I never thought I would miss seeing my colleagues or I never thought that I would miss the actual drive to work. Many people still aren't missing the commute, by the way. But there are many things that we are missing. We're missing seeing loved ones, especially our elderly loved ones who maybe live somewhere else or here in America, we have elderly that live in assisted living and people haven't been able to visit their loved ones for months. We have people who work in the medical field on the front line and they've had to separate from their families and not see their families and their children. Those are really big losses. They've had, many people have had loved ones die, um, loved ones who are in the hospital and they can't visit them. But then there are the more subtle losses as well that we're missing just based on the change in life. So on the flip side, people are also discovering things that they really like about, hey, I've really had more quality time with my children. I've had more time to connect. Uh, I've had a slower pace of life for some people. I've had, I enjoy being able to get off a work meeting and walk to my kitchen. Um, here, I've been able to go outside a lot and I've really enjoyed being at home and being able to go on walks on a trail. So people have also found things they've really enjoyed and been grateful for. But there's also been a lot of grief. So I'm going to bring up a slide here real quick um, that is, I think, quite helpful around um, the grief. Uh-oh, why is this not running? There we go. There we go. Okay, here we go. Now, this slide is an updated of the stages of grief. So Kubler-Ross initially created these five stages of grief that has sort of been modified um, over time. People really saw it as very linear, and I just want to point out that grief is not linear we can move through several of these in a day, even in an hour. So we usually start in shock and disbelief. We usually start with, it's really hard to believe. And we all were there together when this started. It was very surreal. We were all sort of like trying to figure out what was going on. And then we move into feeling the loss of you know, children not going to school, us not being able to leave our homes, um, missing going out of the home and seeing people and running errands and socializing and having a dinner out, um, all of these things we start to miss. And then we have sort of aware or not aware, we start to get angry or even bargain. Um, what can we do to relieve ourselves from this? This is not okay. Or being mad that other people aren't following the guidelines the way we are. Uh, depression is where we start to feel alone. We start to feel overly isolated. Let me point out that introverts, people who are more to themselves, have had a different experience of all of this than extroverts. In my private practice with clients, extroverts have had a much harder time with being at home and being sheltered in place. There is a moment in our grieving process where there's an upward turn. Maybe you start to see the benefits or the positives. With some of my clients, we've discussed um, 
you know, what are the silver linings? Meaning what are the areas of gratitude? What are the opportunities for growth? What are the things that you want to do differently going forward because of this experience? Who do you want to be after this? And how can you take some power back over how you want to live your life differently as you move back into life from this? The reconstruction and working through in any grief, a, lo a lost loved one or anything, is where we begin to figure out how we still live and function with this new reality. It is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and it looks very different for every different person. And then there's a moment of acceptance and hope. I wanna be clear, that doesn't mean the grief is gone. In my, in my country here of the United States, we do a very terrible job as a society uh, recognizing these stages of grief. We do not have good rituals for supporting people through grief. It's, it's very unfortunate. And acceptance and hope does not mean the grief is gone. You know, I lost my father. I will never not feel sad about his departure, but I have accepted that he's not here. I have learned what life is to not have him physically here, but it doesn't mean I got over it. It means I've learned to live without him here. So I wanna make sure people understand that. And then um, for some that is much easier based on your spiritual beliefs than for others to accept that. Um, so what do we do with the losses and the grief? Well, different families, different individuals and different cultures have very different beliefs about that. And rituals can be very helpful and supportive. One is some of us are very supported by talking to friends who are also feeling this. It can be very cathartic, very helpful to talk to others. And it can also be that we need to just acknowledge it. Like, this is really hard. This is, you know, for, you know, crying is a somatic release. Having sadness come out in whatever way it comes out is a way to release it so we're no longer holding it. Um, I invite you to find, even if it's private time, permission to just have your sadness. Um, one of the things we don't do very well is just giving ourselves permission to be where we are. That's one of the best ways to move out of it instead of fighting it. Um, get, get the things that bring you pleasure, bring them into your life if you're grieving, if you're depressed. Find some things to make you laugh, connect, Find things to look forward to. Little tiny moments make a big difference. We have a skill here that we often tell people to use. It's the hardest one, but the most effective when you're depressed or grief-stricken. It is called opposite action to emotion. Opposite action to emotion means you do the opposite of what depression wants you to do. Depression says, isolate, stay in bed, feel alone. And when you do the opposite, you get up and you go and you say something to someone, you find a way to connect, you do something to get in motion. I'm gonna pause for a moment. Folks are saying they cannot hear me again. Nidhi, are, are you able to hear me? We can hear you fine, we can hear you okay. fine. Okay, great. Just wanna make sure I'm not talking and no one can hear me. Sorry if you're having audio problems. All right, so let's give you a few little tools for the body if you need to tap the gas pedal. The first thing is when I'm shut down and I'm feeling numb, is movement is the most important thing to do. If you are really struggling, it can be the tiniest of movement. Moving and feeling the sensation of your body is the first step in bringing you from purple in our slide back up into green movement okay so right now we're going to do orienting to the room we're in so just slowly turn your head to the left open up and look around really take in that side of the room slowly turn to the right give yourself a nice long sigh <sighs> anything that expands and contracts the diaphragm is very settling very helpful just feeling the neck turn, doing some shoulder rolls. Now this seems very small and simple. How is this gonna help my grief? You're telling your brain is sending a message right now as you move that says, hey, sympathetic, 
turn on, turn on, we're moving here. So everything will start to very slowly start to come up. So you wanna feel into sensation. Notice something, the texture of something your hand is touching. Maybe notice what the bottoms of your feet are touching right now. Just feel the sensation of that. One of the most important things we can do to get a little more settled in our body is to feel our, our legs and our feet. So if you can even lift, lift your legs up off the ground a little bit and feel all your muscles hold you up in your legs, hold that for three seconds and then drop your legs, settle back to the ground. You will feel a little more here and in your body. Okay, now I'm gonna give you a really silly one, but these are based in research and science, believe it or not, on our neuro systems and our nervous system. So this one is called the lion's roar. And our facial muscles have a great deal to do with activating uh, sympathetic nervous system. So if I can pretend to do a lion's roar, if you're in a space where you feel comfortable to try it, you can feel a little, in yoga, they do breath of fire. If that's more comfortable to you, do breath of fire. These are very important small shifts to move us up towards that green comfort zone, out of shutdown. I'm gonna give you one more that many meditation, chanting meditations do things similar to this. This is a particular sound and many of these come from a trauma technique that is worldwide. It is called somatic experiencing, somatic experiencing. And it was created by Peter Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E. -E. He has written many wonderful books about trauma. And so he is where I learned some of these things. And the one that we're gonna do next to bring us from lower energy into higher energy is called VU. You gather your breath and you hold the VU as if you're a foghorn. So it's a very low VU holding sound. And what that's going to do is stimulate your entire vagus nerve. The vagus nerve will then get stimulated. And this is going to move you into a more energized space. So it sounds like this. Feel free to join me if you are comfortable. You gather all the air from your belly. <sighs> I'm gonna share my screen with you so that you can see the vagus nerve right here. This is your vagus nerve. And I want you to know there are many things you can do to support your vagus nerve. It's the wandering nerve, super highway. It connects your brain to your second brain. And we're learning more and more that our gut brain has a great deal to do with our health and our mental health, believe it or not. So having good vagus nerve is going to support anti-inflammation, antidepressant effect. Your gut is gonna be supported, histamine issues. Look at all of the things that are supported when we do vagus nerve. So I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of things that you can research online, but let me tell you some things you can do to stimulate your vagus nerve. You can gargle liquid, you can gargle mouthwash. You can do ear massage, foot massage, singing, humming, doing the voo, eating things that are good for your gut health also helps the vagus nerve system. Then stimulating the vagus nerve is actually like, the way I say it is like growing your emotional mus muscles so that in our window, our green window can get bigger. When our vagus nerve, is stimulated, it's a good working muscle, we are going to be healthier and we're going to have a greater window to tolerate distress. So that is why doing VU and things like that can be so important as a tool to use throughout the day. Use VU, VU when you are low energy and you're trying to get more energy. It's very, very helpful. So also another one that actually stimulates your vagus nerve goes back to what I said a little bit ago, everyone. Laughter. Laughter also stimulates it uh, very well. So let me come back. I'm going to go into questions in one minute. Um, I want to quickly move into the four fundamentals of feeling better. If you're very tired, if you're feeling very exhausted, if you're, if you're having some health issues related to your stress, 
the four fundamentals of managing your energy better right now are sleep, number one, hydration and nutrition, number two, moving your body, number three, and breath and using breath. Those are your four fundamentals for feeling better physically, mentally, emotionally. We know that sleep and chronic sleep deprivation causes so many different health issues over time, neuropsychiatric issues, cognition issues, somatic issues, high blood pressure, high stress hormones, difficulty with sexual functioning, increased food cravings, insulin resistance, diabetes, heart disease, all sorts of things, our metabolism, so many things get affected if we do not sleep well. So my first most important thing to you, consider getting some help with sleep. Change your bedtime ritual. Maybe try changing, uh, working with how your bedroom is set up, what you do before night, how you get yourself to settle and slow down. Anything you can do to improve the length and the quality of your sleep will really help you to manage the stress of the situation and the depression or the loss. So sleep is hugely important. The second one is to drink more water. If you can access more clean water, and that's not easy for everyone right now, to be honest, but, but water and hydration are very important for us feeling mentally better. Also, eating a healthy diet, of course, more raw fruits, vegetables, um, nutrient-rich foods, uh, and of course, the Indian spices are wonderful for anti-inflammation and for health. So that is really good. And the movement you know, can be anything. If you're literally stuck in your house and you cannot go out, finding ways to just get up, stretch, yoga, walking the length of the space you have, moving, doing some exercises, anything counts as movement. If you can get outside safely, that's even better. Uh, and then the last thing is the breath. So the breath, I, I really love this um, quote that I found about breath. Breath is the, let's see if I can say it correctly. It is the manipulation of the breath. We can recalibrate our entire system. So using all of the breath work that you already have and know that shifts you, but doing it regularly throughout the day. So one that I often have clients do when they're very tired and they're feeling, feeling shut down from sitting and focusing on the screen is I have them do the workout breath as if they're running a race, even though they're sitting. So I may have them stand up if they've been sitting too long. I may have them sit if they've been standing too long. And I have them do a breath as if they're sprinting. <laughs> Again, this tells your brain that we are actually running and it sends you into a sympathetic nervous system state, even though you're not running. So we can actually really trick our brain. The last thing I wanna leave you with is one of the most important things. If any of these tools are not working for you and you feel like they're not really helping me, Kelly, I would take a guess that we have this sabotager getting in the way, the brain, our thoughts. This is again why meditation is so useful because we can notice those thoughts and go back to the task at hand, mindfulness, right? I will give you this. Um, I like to tell people to imagine that you have a little news reporter sitting on your shoulder and your news reporter is there to just observe the facts and describe the facts to you and to check the facts, right? So when I am depressed, I am narrating a story that supports me feeling bad. I am telling myself, everything is so terrible. I'm so sad, I can't do it. I'm saying all these things. And sometimes I don't even realize that is who is narrating my life. If I bring in observing what I'm doing and noticing my thoughts mindfully, then I need to switch them. So I call it the swipe. I imagine, sitting at the end of a factory and watching my thoughts come down the conveyor belt and then I sort them into buckets. This is a really great mindfulness exercise for your thoughts. Or I imagine the thoughts passing by like clouds and then I remind myself, I choose what thought I give power to. Who is narrating the story right now, Kelly? 
Is it the, the voice of anxiety or is it the voice of my wise centered meditative self? So if I hear a bunch of thoughts going by and I say, oh, oh gosh, yes, this is, I'm never going to get this done in time. I'm going to be in big trouble. And I grab that thought and now I'm spinning in it and I'm getting really distressed. So what I'm inviting myself and my clients to do is we picture the thought going by and then we swipe it. We swipe it. We swipe it in our mind. We swipe it. I, I don't need that thought. That's not helpful. And I'm consciously then choosing. I am okay in this moment. My family is okay in this moment. All is well. That's the thought I'm going to grab. So cognitive strategies. Very, very important to use these cognitive strategies of mindfulness, checking a thought, bringing in the narrator of your life that you need in that moment. So I often say as a joke to my clients, you know, therapists are, we're not perfect in home, at home either, right? I'm a psychotherapist, I'm not perfect at home. Sometimes I wish I could bring Kelly the therapist home with me so she could help me <laughs> to remember what I need to do. So we all have to practice these things. And the more you get settled, the more you can find your way into this place of, okay, right here, right now, the most important tool for anxiety, everyone, is to be in this present moment. The most important tool for anxiety is to come into the present moment because anxiety is telling us what could happen, but it's not happening, right? Stress is, is going into all sorts of directions beyond what's here and now. If I come back to here and now, right here, right now, what is true, Kelly? Right here, right now, what is true for you? Right here, right now, I am here with all of you beautiful people, and we are sharing this moment to help and support each other. That's the truth. I am here with you right now. You see how different that feels to my body? Right here, everything is okay in this moment. We will get through this together. You see how different that is? So. Your power is to come bring yourself back here. You may have to do it many times a day right now, many times a day. And don't forget your swiper. Swipe that thought. That's not the thought that's helping me right now. Okay? Okay. Questions for you all. I am ready 